All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is my <clears throat> Baja Kumeyaay special. Uh, I've been apprehensive, to say the least, about this um, because it's not necessarily in my wheelhouse, but suffice it to say, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> so I've been practicing, uh, not practicing, I've been researching the Kumeyaay from Baja. Mm, not too much. So it's been about five years since I've been doing this. And for a, a small part of that, I've had a, a brief exposure to the Baja and Kumeyaay, uh, the Kumeyaay uh, down in Baja, California. And so I want to start today with an interview, the only one I did of the, the Kumeyaay and Baja uh, Kumeyaay member, Martha uh, Rodriguez. So she is the 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 I guess the director of the Saquon Cultural Center. So if you're interested in a, a good um, extra credit or just to go check it out, you have the Saquon Cultural Center right there. Great archive. They have a ex extensive archive. It is it is the envy of the of the area. Now Barona wish we wish we had it, for example. So the archive is has all Florence Shipic stuff her baskets, all that. It's a remarkable collection. Um, so I'm going to start off with this interview and then I'm gonna carry on to continue with uh, our discussion today. So first, let me check out my audio before I transfer or start the video. Microphone. All right, okay. And let me just transfer this. Two, check one, two. All right. All right. So here is Martha, Anna Martha Gloria Rodriguez. Again, with uh, today is Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. My name is Ethan Benegas, and I'm interviewing Martha Rodriguez at the Kumeyaay Community College and Saquon Cultural Center in Al Cajon, California. So we'll just start with, uh, what is your full name and your date of birth and your place of birth? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm Martha Nishin at uh, Hello, my name is Ana, well, my name is Ana Gloria Rodriguez, but everyone want to call me Martha. Okay, and Ana then, Gloria. Um, so you're Ana Gloria Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. I'm from San Jose de la Zorra. You said date of birth? Yeah, date of birth and place oh, of birth. Um, born in Ensenada, uh, January 31st, uh, 1978. Hmm. So what was your mother's name? When and where was she born? And what was her profession? Um, my mom, uh, Gloria Castañeda, Gloria Castañeda Silva from San Jose de la Zorra. Uh, uh, she was a Kumeyaay, um, what is it? Kumeyaay uh, traditional chairperson, I guess. Oh. Chairwoman? Uh huh. But no, they call it like jefe tradicional. Uh, traditional chief, I guess. Okay. Yeah, she was a traditional chief. Yeah. So, hereditary? Uh, well, the elders uh, give her the position because um, it was even more people elder than here in the community. She was the one who uh, started going outside the reservation to speak Spanish mm. and stuff like that, and promoting the culture and the language and stuff like that. So the elders give that position. Okay, so you call it selected. It wasn't hereditary. No, it was selected. Selected. Uh -huh. And um, so your mom was a hereditary chief of what reservation? San Jose de la Zorra. And okay, what was your father's name? When and where was he born? And what was his profession? Um, Gregorio Montes Vega, uh, is, um, he was Payaki and Kumeyaay, mm. and then, um, um, he was, uh, he worked in, uh, what do you call, um, they call Jornaleros, no, no, never mind, sorry, not that one, <laughs> um, he was, uh, like a cowboy, so he worked in ranch, and stuff like that. Cowboy, like a vaquero, huh? Yeah. Right on. My family was a bunch of vaqueros. Yeah, the, the Benegas. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, and he used to work um, 
working with goats and sheep and stuff like that to get to one place or another. Like okay. from uh, um, from San Jose all the way in other side of Ensenada. So I have a lot of stories like um, taking all those animals, you know, just walking, take weeks and weeks and oh, wow. know, just moving there. All this like thousands of animals. Yeah. So to graze, to eat the food, right? Mm -hmm. To graze along. Yeah. So you have to move, move to different spots uh -huh. to eat. Yeah, when it was like, when Ensenada was not even a city and it was just like a small little ranch and, yeah. you know, there were not fences or nothing. So that's how the kind of work. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Thought I put it on silent. So your dad was a, a vicero and your mom was a chief. Mm -hmm. is, is that the word you use down there, chief? Uh, well, they call jefe tradicional. Uh -huh. So what is the translation? I think it's a traditional chief. Traditional yeah. chief. Uh -huh. And then she, because, uh, you know, she, you know, she, of course, she speaks the language and other culture and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So every had to be or something related to that. We always go to my mom. And then we also have in the community have the, um, like the legal chairperson. Yeah. So they, they work, in, you know, together. So we have two chiefs. Yeah. The traditional one and the political, the legal, whatever, you know. Yeah, political one. Yeah, the political one, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, here we call, we before a chairperson, it was it was a spokesperson or it was a captain. Mm -hmm. Did they ever have that terminology in Baja? I think that was a traditional. Captain? Yeah. And then now they don't mm -hmm. use captain anymore? No, they just call jefe tradicional. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, chief. Yeah. Because that's the one have the knowledge, you know, with the culture and the language and all that. Wow. Yeah. I wish we had one of those. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and they support each other, you know, with the political one and the traditional one. Hmm. Yeah. And then, because now a lot of like they have a young uh, share person, a share woman. And then I guess with the traditional one, they would like advise the political one too, to just to, you know, to preserve the language and the culture. And, you know, don't forget about that part. So they were like uh, mm. reunited and working for the whole community. And as far as elections go, mm. how do you, how do the elections work down there? Um, for the political one, yeah. I mean, they had to do uh, vote. They had to vote on the person. But uh, we don't have that many members, so. Um, how many members do you have? I think maybe there are maybe like around 300 maybe. Yeah, and then a lot of people that live in, you know, they live outside of the reservation or they're outside of the community. So a lot of people, they don't see them as a part of the community anymore. So mm -hmm. that's a big problem too, because um, they see like an outsider. Yeah. But I mean, they still are Kumia, you know, even though they're, the, you know, they're outside. How many people <clears throat> live on the reservation? Would you think half maybe? Uh, no, maybe around that like right now, we maybe like 200. 200, so yeah. 30, 66 percent. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah they mostly they live, but uh, they have a few families that they left a long time ago, mm -hmm. and then um, they want to come back, but the people would not accept them back because some of them they saw some land close by too, so they were just scared like people would do the same thing or come and try to sell the land again. Oh, so they come back. To get free land and then sell it. Well, that happened with one family. Oh, really? That's why they don't want to uh, welcome back to to the community. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, and then elections. How, how long are the election cycles? I think they have to have like two or three meetings. Yeah. So, so two or three meetings a year. No, no, for uh, to do the elections. Elections. Yeah, because they have to come somebody from, you know, to. How do you say legalize the whole yeah. new travel council and stuff like that? So there's an outsider from the Mexican government. Yeah, from the Mexican government. Oh, that's strange. Yeah. And they so they all come to kind of legitimize mm -hmm. or authorize yeah. the election. And is that every two, three, four years? Every three years. Three years. Uh huh. And how many council members do you have? Well, they have to be the the president, the secretary, and treasurer. And they call the jefe vigilancia, mm -hmm. like um, political one. Yeah, no, like um, like the vice chairman and the you know vice secretary and stuff like that. No, like six. Yeah. And then six plus the like your mom, right? Yeah, the traditional yeah. chief. Uh -huh. 
But right now we don't have one. Mm. Yeah. We don't have one. So what do you think, um, kind of on that line, do you think it's going the wrong direction as far as the tradition goes? Um, like without your mom being there? Do you think that's kind of a, a, a like symbolic of a transition away from mm -hmm. tradition? Well, I mean, you know, it's even harder and harder to keep the traditions alive, you know, because uh, with modern times now, you know, the kids that want to be, you know, have all these stuff that everyone have outside in the reservation, you know, want to be comfortable and, mm -hmm. you know, want to listen to all this music and sometimes they don't want to practice, you know, you know, the bird song and the boat, you know, they just want to hear something else. And, and then, um, and I think we don't have the, um, that community uh, advising the kids what to, to do, you know, with their lives. Sometimes it's, it's very easy to just forget about, you know, our own culture. Mm. It gets related to the other ones. And then if you don't see the value in the language too, you know, there will be another way to, to want to learn something else. Yeah. So you think the threat is like modern times, modernity? Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, so and then <clears throat> while, while you're on it, what do you think about assimilation as far as kind of, because that's, cause that's what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Assimilating into the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, what are your feelings on assimilation in Baja? So I, I, we kind of know what's up here what's going on but how is it down there because uh, it seems to me from the outside mm -hmm. that there's way more culture way more tradition way more speakers but what's what do they say when like down there when they talk about assimilation um but you know there's another way to i think a lot of people you know like i say you know they like to have all this you know be comfortable and mm -hmm. you know all this new things and, and then, um, you know, instead of like, you know, for example, you know, you can just go buy tortillas in the store instead of making it from scratch, you know, it's a lot of time and a lot of work and, and all that, you know, and then uh, sometimes it's easy to just to go to the easy way, you know? Yeah. And then, um, but I think it's something we need to learn, you know, to, to be in balance, you know, to those new, you know, things and, and you know, our traditions. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, because it's important, you know, to to keep our traditions alive because that's how we are, you know, the identity, our language, and stuff like that. And then, uh, like somebody said, you know, we, we lost a lot of our traditions and language and stuff like that. We come up with like a somebody else too, you know, somebody else. And then, uh, I think we, we are very rich, you know, we know our culture, we know our language, we know who we are. I think our roots are very deep, you know, in this land. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and it's something beautiful a lot of people don't have, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, I think that um, it's important for us to learn, you know, who we are, you know, to, to love and value all the stuff and then, um, and to respect it, you know, mm -hmm. and then, um, I think with that, you know, you will enjoy the new things too, enjoy you know, a lot of the stuff we have, the new stuff, but at the same time, we always protect what we have because that's who we are. And then, um, yeah. Nice. So as far as language goes while we're on it, mm -hmm. so your parents both speak language, their language? Uh, my mom, yeah. My dad a little bit. Okay. Because uh, for the, my dad from uh, his... Um, Father's side, um, they were Yaki from Sonora. So when they, they I guess they have a war, a war or something like that in Sonora, and some people came to Baja. And then, uh, uh, so that was my family's, uh, my dad's family. And then um, uh, he was uh, in an orphanage in Ensenada. So he's going, you know, the, the, the Yaki side, they want him to go to school and stuff like that. So he put him in an orphanage. and. But uh, his mom was Kumia from San Jose, from uh, I was Escondida, she's like right next to San Jose La Zorra. And then, um, so he escaped, so he escaped and then he went back to San Jose and then who grew up over there, in, you know, in the, in the community. Hmm. And then, uh, so yeah, he didn't learn really. He knows a lot of the language, but he was mostly working, you know, going to the different ranches and stuff like that, working 
Mm. So he knows mm. a little bit, of, didn't yeah. have to speak, would you say? Yeah, yeah, he knows mm. a little bit, you know, especially when they were drinking, you know, that was like talking and making jokes and stuff yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or singing with other guys. So he knows. All right. So I'm going to conclude that interview at this moment and fill in the blanks. So just in the sake of time and um, being respectful of your time, I just wanted you to see the beginning, see, see who she was. And there's a lot of good stuff in the beginning, such as the political structure. Her mother was a cultural chief. And I really, I really love that. And it's really such a special thing. And we have them here, you know, it's, it's, and I, and I, I really thought about this particularly uh, for us that we do have a we do have cultural leaders, but it's kind of de facto. It's not necessarily um, f formal. It's an informative thing. I can think of two. I can think of John Chrisman of the AHOS. He's also the tribal chairman, and I think of Junior Cuero of Campo, who's also the tribal chairman. And these are our bird singers, um, and John sings Ilsha. So the bird singer um, and Ilsha, those are two different styles. There's about a dozen styles. Um, those are two bird. Most people only know bird. So we do have them, but it's not a formal position. I really like this as a as a kind of a remedy for for the direction we're going. And something I I wanted to um, discuss was exactly that. So let me let me discuss. Um, hold on, I'm always paranoid about my audio. Okay, so one of the interesting things is, um, so her mother was a Jefe de Tradicional in San Jose de la Sora, and there are, um, you know what, let me do this first, I'm sorry. I wanna show my PowerPoint presentation first. I need I need you to understand the, the context we're talking about. So this is a, a slideshow that my, a student of mine did. And Jordan and Carla taught me so much. They're actually, um, Carla's from there. She's from La Nequa. She's my student. And that was kind of the beginning of from, from my journey for, in this. And I'm still, still a novice, but I'm doing my best. So I believe this is a mural in Takate of of a kumiai person and symbolism um, but this is really what i wanted to show you so there are over 20 communities approximately this is always in flux and it's it's it changes um periodically but there's a there's about 12 governments in uh there's exactly 12 government kumiai governments in the united states but there are reservations with no Indians on them. So El Capitan is on there, but it's not a community, it's not a government. So whenever you're, you're given the question, how many reservations there are, you're gonna get multiple answers because of that specific reason that there's you know reservations with no one on them, but they're still considered reservations. But I think for the sake of, sake of just kind of being more clear, I, I, I define a community a reservation with with a, as a community as a government so and then also you get into recognition so there is only four recognized ejidos they're not reservations they're called ejidos in baja that's the top four um nejo la zora nequa la huerta and then there's la a peña blanca uh la tuna and then there's two more that are unrecognized there's actually missing one on here so there's a total of eight communities in Baja, four are only recognized by the government. And as, and, as, and as she stated, the government will come and authorize their, their political um, leaders every you know, three or four years. I, don't, I wasn't sure clear on who that was, um, on, on how often it was. So here is the, uh, here's the deal. <laughs> you know, if in, if that's Biden's thing. So here's the deal. There's roughly 40 tribe, uh, tribes, territories today that straddle the border directly. Um, but many indigenous communities uh, have traditions of crossing the border freely. 
with members in old age uh, settlements that fan out across modern legal boundaries. So traditionally, and this is the problem with colonization, especially Africa, Africa is the ultimate example. The Middle East is actually even a better example of folks just coming and cutting up uh, continents like a cake, having no regard for indigenous patterns, migratory patterns of, of not only people, but animals and birds. And it's, it's such a colonial mentality of, you know what, I'm just gonna draw a line, that's mine, this is yours. And here we are. And you know, Iraq is a bit best example of, of this being the biggest problem. You're putting three groups, the Sunnis, the Shias, and the Kurds in a state that should have never existed. Um, and it's and this is why we have the problems today. So that's a that's an example of this as well. But in our territory, we have the same problems, but maybe not as as acute. And so we we're going to get into that the problems of the colonial border. And as we started with this course with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, all of a sudden this line just happened. You know, imagine we've been here for tens of thousands of years, and then one day you wake up. And now there's a line <laughs> and you can't cross it. Okay. So it's, if you, you got to really understand this as kind of an, an absurd, an absurd reality that we live in, like so many things we live in the modern world. Um, you know, we just live in a, in crazy times and, and the border is, is something that is really perplexing if you really understand it. So here's the modern border. Uh, as we as we saw recently with Trump, uh, uh, his his push to build the wall, this is even more pronounced. Um, and what well, at this at the end of the day, we're the same people. Uh, they're T Pi. A lot of us are E Pi. There's two different dialects, two different kind of groups, but we're all one nation with the same traditions, environment, uh, material. Uh, material like, you know, such as, you know, baskets, acorns, all these things. We were the same people from our material culture. Uh, here's a little picture of the land bases that are recognized, La Huerta, La, uh, Nequa, De La Zora, ne Nehi. Um, and here's kind of where they are. Some are really close to Tecate, as you see it. Some are more down towards Ensenada. And here's a little photograph uh, the Tijuana watershed. All of them are located along the watershed, the Tijuana watershed. And as you know, that watershed empties out into I Imperial Beach, which is in, in the headlines lately um, as, as sewage is being dumped. And as, as Martha said, her dad was a shepherd. Um, and you know this is kind of how he made his money go going through the hills. Also, their vaqueros. This is exactly who we were, and when I say we, the you know people of Barona, a lot of us were, um, let's say, in the 1930s. So 100 years ago, this is the same economy we had, and we kind of, um, the basically the cattle industry disappeared in California, right after the railroad was introduced, and um, you had competition with Texas and stuff, but. So that slowly became, uh, and also there was a huge drought where all the cows died. And so all these things came to, to kind of end the industry, but it, that industry is still alive and well in Mexico. Uh, however, it's being stressed. And one of the big reasons that Jordan stated was they're competing for water with Tecate, uh, the cities around, and this is one of the examples that they're fighting for resources and they're not winning, so they're being marginalized. Um, there's a little photos of, of the reservation from her, my student, uh, Jordan, thank you very much. And yeah, and then what they do now, what I really dig about what they're doing is what I wanna highlight is, is community activism. It's a grassroots activism of sending, sending goods and need, um, you know, supplies, you name it, money down to Mexico. And this is something that I would hope that we do. That's the end of the slideshow, it's pretty short. And, but this, there's a precedence to it. So folks were doing this, Tony Pino is the, one of the best examples from uh, Weapai of sending, you know, sending folks down there materials and stuff where just by himself in his truck, he would go down there. Um, 
uh, Louis Wasik, Stan Rodriguez, they did that in the 90s. And now Jordan and Carla are doing it now where they're going collecting stuff and sending it down there. But I want to I want to say highlight something though very make it very clear is that they're not completely impoverished and and you know wealth is more than material and it's more than money. Wealth is your culture, it's your family, and it's your community. And that's what they have. So they are very wealthy in that regard and they have a lot of good things going on. Martha, and one, of the, one of the things Martha did, said in her interview, which I'm not showing, is they have all their, um, their, their speakers. Their 80% of our speakers are in, are in Baja. To give you an example, Barona has two more speakers uh, left. Uh, some reservations have zero. Some have two, some have three, some have one. And in my lifetime, all those speakers will be gone. And uh, the, the, the health of a language is how many young people are learning. And so we're not necessarily doing that. Hopefully we are in moving in the right, right direction with apps and, and programs, maybe some type of babble where we're creating young, vibrant speakers to replace those folks who are, are passing away. And so 80% of our speakers down there are down there. And also a good amount of our knowledge of our culture, um, just like how to create tools and crafts. So one of the things they do in uh, San Jose de la Zora is, and Martha talks about this in an interview, is they do a lot of crafting. Uh, it's like a tourist. So a lot of, a lot of Mexicans will, will you know, set up on the reservation, they have a campground. And then as they sit there, as they um, have their, their stay there, they'll have a, a menu. So you can have a traditional menu or you can have like a standard Mexican dish, you know, carne asada, or you could have like deer and shawi. And so they, they, they still know how to make these, these things, uh, our food. And when I, I remember at KCC one day, I smelled something in the kitchen and I was like, it, I never smelled it before. And she was making a yucca omelet so she took a little yucca flowers and made an omelet with it. I was like, all right, cool. You know, it's, it's pretty tasty. Uh, but the smell was, was totally, I was like, man, what is, what is she doing in there? But it was cool. I dig it. So they know all these things. Um, and that's one thing Martha says, you know, as especially with COVID, you know, everyone was tripping out about food. She's like, I can just go out in the hills and eat something. I can make something just by walking and picking it and finding it. And so they have that. They have cult, the tools. So a lot of, uh, one of the things Stan told me is, um, and that's their husband, he's a he's the director of KCC, is that um, he learned how to make um, all these tools like uh, sandals, a tool boat, um, and that's a boat made of tool, tooly weeds, and uh, all of these things. So it's like an arts and crafts like center that perpetuates the culture. And it's just this really cool thing because on our on our side, we don't we kind of lost that knowledge and that practice and that kind of need. So they, they actually use it as part of their economy. So they have this incentive to keep it going. And, as, and one of the things we talked about in this interview is modernity. Modernity takes away our incentive to keep going because a lot of these things are more difficult. You know, we take the easy route. That's, the, that's hum, what human nature, take the easy route, the comfortable route. And often that leads us to um, not make our own food when you can just go to the grocery store. That's the ultimate example. Um, and then tools and all these things. You, you're just like, you know, I'm just going to go buy a, a pair of sandals, a boat. And so it's hard to find the intrinsic value and teach it to our kids to perpetuate these, these things to the future. And, and um, so one of the things that's interesting to note is the up here we have reservations. Down there they have ajidos. And an ajido is different than a reservation. A reservation is tribal land tenure. Um, it's in the United States is defined as tribal trust lands where the United States the government holds legal title and the tribes have beneficial interest. So, and down there it's different. And ajido, it's kind of more like allotments. I mean, it's hard to really, you know, compare it to anything. Um, a kibbutz is something I thought about. Um, What's the other thing in uh, Russia? Programs or 
uh, or communes. I think uh, Stalin had those where it was, uh, and I'm probably, you know, way off on that, but I'm trying to pull, pull from something I know. But tribal land in Mexico is comprised of ejidos or communally owned plots of, plots of land specifically used for agriculture, where tribal members farm individual parcels and collectively maintain uh, holdings with the government oversight. So it has this agriculture aspect that we don't really have. And that's why I say a kibbutz or these other things where it was specifically, it was communal based, but for farming uh, uh, specifically. But one of the things that's more like um, interesting is that like what she said is where tribal members will sell their individual plots of land, diminishing the communal property holdings. So in a way, it's a lot like allotments up here. And that's why they're wary of having folks come in because then they could just sell it off. And that's something that's happened uh, up here quite a bit. Pine Ridge is the ultimate example of checkerboard. Um, there's little checkers missing inside the, the reservation. And so one of the things that, you know, as we talked about that border, it, it was extremely devastating. It cut us right in half in, in 1848. We had the size of the territory, the size of Delaware, which went all the way up to San Luis Rey River to 50 miles south of Ensenada to the coast, all the way to Yuma. This vast expanse was ours for, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years, if not longer. And so this, you know, foreign encroachment happened 250 years ago at the conclusion of the Mexican American war. And what happened was, is during the, during the California genocide, during this period of time where California Indians were being killed, persecuted, enslaved, a lot of Indians flew to, fled to the mountains or they fled across the border. And once, and then they didn't realize, so it's important to remember this, native people all along the, the Northern and Southern border, they didn't realize what a border was, let alone where it was. So all of a sudden they were on the wrong or right side of this border and they were either a citizen or not. And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in writing stated that all Mexicans uh, were considered American citizens if they stayed. A lot of Mexicans left, um, a lot of Mexicans stayed to get citizens, citizenship. So under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it was guaranteed citizenship to, to the Kumeyaay. But if you were on the wrong side, you were, you were out. And this is something Delfina Coro states in her autobiography. It's a great book if you're interested. Um, the Kumeyaay have suffered in many ways from this board, uh, border. Chief among them are enrollment. For example, tribes cannot use Baja blood. So we don't, we don't recognize that as blood in, in Baja. So, and you know, it could be argued they're more Kumeyaay than us. I mean, that's not a stretch. And yet we can't use their, their blood. So it's bananas. Uh, mobility is probably chief among them. And then secondly is economic opportunity and cultural exchange. So with this border comes all these challenges. But a generation ago, safe passage uh, was kind of, it was a given. You didn't have the border tightening up till the war on drugs and Nixon and then by the 90s, you have a real strict border. So um, we have the, the war on drugs to blame for that, um, ultimately. And then now you have literally a wall going up. So you have the ultimate extreme from, the, from a long time ago. Before you would have kind of a very porous border. Say, hey, hello, hi, Halka. The, the border patrol would know you're Indian and they would say Halka often. And that's what... Um, Junior Cuero remembered of Campos. So Campos really close to the border and he remembers folks coming back and forth uh, with news uh, and solidarity. So every time they would come across, and this is in Campo, they would say, oh yeah, so-and-so got married or there's a gathering, um, there's an anniversary. And he said they would come walking out of the bushes. I mean, this is a, a child, you know, interpreting it. And they'd stay for a while and then they go back. This, you know, and so you had this kind of exchange that was been around for 10, uh, 10 12,000 years at least, uh, still happening in Campo uh, in the 60s. 
So it wasn't it wasn't too long ago where we were still com- connected. We were still combined as a, as one nation, and you have uh, this beautiful kind of you know synergy of, of relationships. And and so we are in a different era now where that that is becoming. A more, um, and this is one thing Martha states in her interview, is that, you know, one of the reasons, the one of the big problems is, is folks are now identifying with um, as American or Mexican, not Kumeyaay. So she makes it a clear um, statement to say, I'm Kumeyaay first, Mexican second. She she considers herself Kumeyaay first, and I would argue that most. Uh, American Kumeyaay, if you were if you were to survey them, this would be a great survey. What are you first? What do you define yourself as? And I, and it would be an interesting study. Okay, so you know I I have read books and heard people portray the Kumeyaay as impoverished and, and down there and and us as better off, but I think it's more complicated than that. The Kumeyaay and Baja retain much of their culture and their language. Eighty percent of the remaining speakers live in Mexico whereas the United States are lacking in these vital areas. It has become more and more apparent that we, the United States Kumeyaay and Mexican Kumeyaay, need to be more united if we want to survive as one Kumeyaay nation. Cross-border cultural exchange would help restore a dormant language and culture in the United States, and Baja communities would benefit immensely from access to higher education and new economic opportunities in the United States. So we need each other. That's really what I was trying to uh, say. This is a little piece I wrote up for Martha's um, interview. It's her preface. So I would say we definitely need to mend mend these these gaps if we want to survive as a unique, distinct people. What we have, they need. What they have, we need. And and it's not you know it's it's the I think that's just how it's supposed to be. You know. Human beings are, we're designed to need each other. Not everyone has everything and it's, it's on purpose. You know, that's why, you know, um, you know, we, we have that kind of desire to, for, for other people because we aren't complete uh, without them. So let me just make sure I am, um, I conclude this before, let me just look at my notes before I conclude. All right. So there's one group I wanted to bring up. The Tahona Odom um, is Tahona Otsum. I'm probably butchering that uh, tribe. And one of the cool things they do is they have um, they offer benefits, and and so there's uh, they're cut in half like us, but so it'd be like for us to have, you know, provide benefits to the tribal members down there, where they would come up. And get health care, and I believe they vote in their tribal council. So, the tribal membership doesn't the border doesn't necessarily uh, affect their tribal membership. It's just you know more challenging. And one of the things that also comes up in this era or area is is tribal citizenship or dual citizenship. So there's a lot of there's a lot of solutions we can that we can do to to fix some of these things. And we would have, we would need the um, to be more creative. That's what I would say. And we need to get our youth involved, and we need to we need to understand how much we could both benefit from this relationship being more uh, solidified. Okay, so uh, that concludes this um, this uh, the Kumeyaay and Baja uh, lecture, and I um, I hope uh, everyone's on 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 task for, for their, uh, their next assignments. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye.